Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus, nothing else wonderful way to start our service of the focus of having Jesus at the centre of our Easter celebrations today. That's what we want to focus on, that's what we just want to centre on today and we hope that your Easter is focused on that. My name's Pam. And I'm Ian and it's an absolute privilege to be hosting our Easter service here from West Road and Wesley Community Church. We've got a real action-packed time together this morning, we've got so much to fit in and we're so glad that you've joined us here this morning. So we've got lots of lovely prayers, we've got beautiful worships and readings, and all of this will just be focusing us on the true meaning of Easter, what happened over 2,000 years ago. And the reason that we're here today, you know, it says in the Bible that had the resurrection not happened, then, you know, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain, mm -hmm. and, and that's the essence. This is the essence of, of what we believe. It's a real celebration for Christians around the world. We are celebrating today. I often talk about, you know, we talk about Christians Christmas being a wonderful celebration time, but for us, Easter is really the pinnacle of the celebration of being a Christian. So, shall we get 
um, straight on and enjoy worshipping together. Yeah, let's do that. Let's worship together.
Over the past year during this coronavirus pandemic, one of the hardest things that we've found at church is to connect with people. We've got such a large and wide and varied church family just spread all over the town and the surrounding villages. And without being able to meet in person, it's been really tough to connect. We've tried our best with online church and thank you so much for joining in the weekly chat during our online services. But at this special Easter time, our staff team thought it was really, really important to connect with as many people from our church congregation as possible. And uh, what have they been up to, Pam? So, you might have been one of the people who've been egged. Um, they've been <laughs> out <laughs> delivering Easter eggs to some of our lovely church family. Mm. I think it's been the over 60s. Ian initially said the over 50s, but then that would have been Ian who had an egg and he Didn't hasn't one. had one. <laughs> So it must have been the over 60s and uh, I think some of our younger um, families as well have had some visits and some deliveries of mm. eggs. So what a lovely way just to wish people a happy Easter by just popping an egg round to them and I hope maybe some of you have um, taken that opportunity to connect with the community where you live too. Absolutely, it's been, thank you so much to our staff team, they have been working tirelessly for the last week or two, just getting out there, knocking on doors, visiting so many people in the surrounding area and we hope you've started to feel a bit more connected. It's not going to be long before we can all meet together as a church and we can't wait for that to happen, can we? Yeah. So now we're going to have a time of prayer led by some members of our Wesley and Westray congregation. We hope you'll enjoy seeing their faces but also um, sharing in this prayer time together. Yeah. And then Asha will be bringing us the reading from Mark on which David Oakley is going to be speaking about today. Absolutely. Yeah, our senior leader David Oakley will be bringing us a really challenging message so please do listen carefully and just allow the God's word just to minister into our hearts. It's a, just we said at the start of our service it's such a special time of the year and it's is a real challenge to each one of us whether you call yourself a Christian or not you know just take these words in and listen to this challenging message and afterwards we're going to be worshipping together again Lord there is not one more redeeming liberating or costly sacrifice than the cross of Christ many don't understand it or accept it they live blinded by its power and grace we cannot hide away or pretend it doesn't exist the power of the cross is not to be shut away, ignored, forgotten or destroyed. Lord, you are the one who reigns supreme. You hold the final victory. You are the one who conquered sin. You conquered death. We are forever changed by your forgiveness and grace. Today, as we remember your resurrection and power over sin and death, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for your death on the cross for each one of us. Thank you for giving everything for us, for enduring separation from your Father so that we can experience your forgiveness and know your joy as we are brought back into a right relationship with your Father. We love you and thank you for all that you've done and all that you mean to us. We choose to follow you and seek to love you. Holy Spirit, will you empower us to live lives that honour Jesus? Our prayer from the book of Colossians in the Bible is that we may live lives worthy of the Lord, that we may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer at this Easter time, a time when we think of new life, hope for the year ahead and new beginnings. But Lord, we want to thank you this morning that Easter time showed us the greatest demonstration of forgiveness to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. All of us at some point have experienced or are experiencing how hard forgiveness can be, particularly when we feel an injustice has been done against us and perhaps no apology offered. How easy it is for us to feel forgiveness is not deserved. And yet, Father, through your immense love for us as your children, 
when we did not deserve it, your son suffered on the cross and cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In all his innocence, that great love was able to forgive us and has shown us through generations there, the power there is through this forgiveness as you made a way for us to be reunited with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your forgiving love. Help us to seek your help as we try and forgive others or even ourselves in order to grow, bear fruit for you and look forward with renewed hope for all that lies ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dear Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to help us, to be bold in telling others the good news about you, their Lord and Saviour, who loves them always. Amen. I was asked to say something, a prayer, or something about the resurrection. Uh, I thought I'd leave it to somebody that uh, could write far better than I can. And this is an extract from a story, Holding Fast, by Hilary Faith Jones. Stephen stretched his legs out in front of him and leant his head back on the wall, felt the warmth of the sun spread on his back and down his shoulders. He smiled. These were wonderful days. To his eyes, it seemed that since the resurrection, the city had become bathed in a glorious glow. He wondered if that was so. Or could it be that he was changed by Christ, that he saw life differently? Maybe as God always intended it to be. The streets were just as crowded. The everyday still had to be faced. Yet everywhere one could sense a tremulous air of expectation. He could only describe it as a time of transformation, the amazing opening of hearts to God, such fierce and joyous burgeoning. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died My riches gain I count but loss And poor content On all my pride I see his head
my life, my all. Mark 16, 1-7 Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here, he is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. Happy Easter everybody, just delighted you could join us here at West Road and Wesley Community Church. My name's David Oakley, Senior Pastor, and I'm just so pleased you could join us on this Easter Sunday. Question for you to get us started today. What is your favourite conspiracy theory? Come on, what is your favourite conspiracy theory? Is it Elvis works at your chip shop? Is it the moon landing? Is it the Loch Ness Monster? Or is it who shot JFK? What, you know, what's the thing you love to chat about and come at different angles at? Okay, you've got that in your mind. Now, where does Jesus of Nazareth rising from the dead compare to that? How does that compare? It's Easter, isn't it? As Christians, we claim Jesus rose from the dead. Is that a conspiracy theory? Or is it something we can really trust? Well, hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you there's really something we can trust in. You can trust that Jesus of Nazareth is alive. And I'm going to give you three reasons why. First of all, because of the eyewitnesses. Secondly, because of the evidence. And thirdly, because of the expectations. As a result of these three things, I believe we really can trust that Jesus rose from the dead. And what we're going to do to help us unpack this is go right back to a primary source. It's called the Book of Mark, and you can find it in the second part of the Bible, the New Testament. And it was written within a generation of Jesus going back to heaven. And it was written from a perspective of Peter. Peter, of course, was a really close friend of Jesus. He hung out with him all the time. And Mark writes this eyewitness account on behalf of Peter. And so we're really going to get stuck into looking at this passage. And Mark really emphasised Jesus being all action and being supernatural and miraculous. And of course, if we're talking about someone rising from the dead, that's the kind of stuff we want to see, isn't it? And we're going to jump right to the end to Mark 16. Where we've left it at Mark 15 is Jesus has been executed by the Roman soldiers. Three times in that chapter it mentions Jesus is dead. So there's no swooning, no coma theories here. He was dead. Then it records how he was placed in a tomb on the hills, the mountainous hills, the rocky hills just outside Jerusalem. Many tombs were carved into the rocks there and Jesus' body was placed in there. So the question, as we follow up on this now, very uh, sport, what's next? What's happening next here is what happened to that body? So firstly, we want to talk about eyewitnesses. Whatever you think about your conspiracy theory, you need good eyewitnesses either to debunk it or to prove it, isn't it? You need someone who is reliable. Let me tell you about these eyewitnesses from Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. So we see these three ladies. These three ladies, they had been there in the crucifixion. They had seen Jesus died. Two of these three ladies then went on to see him being buried. And so here they are early on a Sunday morning after the Friday afternoon when Jesus had died and been buried. They'd had a Sabbath day's rest and now the three of them are coming to the tomb in order to anoint the body of Jesus. Because of course a decaying body is going to smell, isn't it? It's their loving devotion. And so they're turning up here and this is what happens in verses 3 and 4. They asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. So there's no expectations or agenda from these ladies at all. They're going expecting to see a tomb with a big rock across in order to 
basically anoint a dead body. And yet, what do they see? The tombstone is gone. So these eyewitnesses, they are reliable. They're just ordinary people. There's no agenda here. They're not weird or anything like that. They knew Jesus. They were part of his support team. So there was no mistaken identity. They didn't get the wrong tomb because they'd seen where he's buried. These are good, reliable eyewitnesses. So straight away, we're ticking the first box that you can trust that Jesus of Nazareth is alive. But hey, let's move on. What about some physical evidence? Because let's face it, sometimes our eyes can deceive us, can't we? And it doesn't always happen that our eyewitness accounts are exactly accurate. So what does it say in verse 5? As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So the tomb was open and they decided to walk in and they have an encounter with another eyewitness. This eyewitness is actually an angel. The implication of the white robe comes across here. You might say, well, hold on, David, here we're trying to prove something. You're talking about angels now. You're getting weird. Well, actually, we shouldn't be surprised because aren't angels God's messengers? Aren't they part of the supernatural activity of God? And actually, this angel's here to reassure them and encourage them. As we read in verses 6, don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So this angel's trying to reassure them, saying, hey, I know you came for a dead body. I know you came to see that crucified Jesus whose hands were pierced by the nails, but he has risen. And he doesn't just say, right, I've told you that. Now, off you go. He says, come, come and examine the tomb. Come and investigate. And this is the exciting thing. This guy doesn't just say, oh, well, stay away and just believe what I say. He's actually requiring them to examine the evidence that's in front of them, that invitation. And in a way, that's what I want you to do. This is what we're doing today, giving you the invitation. Come on, examine the evidence. Is Jesus risen from the dead? What is the explanation for the physical evidence of an empty tomb? We've got to have some explanation. There's no dead body and the tomb is empty. This is the physical evidence. What explanation can you give? And that brings us on to the expectations. You know, if you witnessed a major event, wouldn't you expect to be different? If history was being changed as a result of what you saw, wouldn't you expect to be different and transformed? Well, this is what happened to these ladies. This is what happened to the followers of Jesus. As we listen in verse, chapter 16, verse 7 of Mark, the angel says, Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So we've heard the eyewitness accounts. We've seen the physical evidence. Now to the expectation that these ladies will go and tell. No longer in the background at the crucifixion. No longer in the background watching the burial. Right at the centre of everything that's going to happen. They're at the forefront now. And also they bring great encouragement. It says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Remember, these are the people who fell. These are the people who fell away. These are the people who were scared and ran off. And Jesus, through the angel, saying, hey, I love you guys. I still want you to be part of things. And then he gives this anticipation of meeting with them again in Galilee. Yes, physically, I'm going to reveal myself to you. And Jesus starts to do that on this Easter Sunday. Six or seven times he appears to different people in different situations on that Easter Sunday. Then for 40 days to over 500 people, he met with other people to show he was resurrected and alive. And so there is this sense of... We've got this expectation we can meet with the risen Jesus, but we haven't actually experienced him yet. This is what's coming across from these ladies. They know in their hearts that Jesus is alive because it was predicted there's going to be a future meeting, but they're still waiting for that experience. And I guess that's where we're at as we think about our response to the risen Jesus. Two action points to finish off. First of all, do you want to know more about the risen Jesus? Do you want to investigate more? See, the thing is, something like resurrection takes a bit of getting used to. <laughs> These disciples had to see Jesus a number of times before they really got it. And we want to offer you the opportunity to investigate more about Christianity. We run something called Alpha. Over 6,000 Alpha courses are running in the UK right now for tens of thousands of people. So you won't be alone. And the other great thing is you can do it from your own living room because we'll do it on a Zoom, perhaps on a Monday night after Easter. And we can run it over a number of weeks where you can ask the hard questions. You know, can we trust the Bible? Who is Jesus? Why did he die? All these kinds of questions. We'd love you 
to respond like these ladies did at the tomb when the angel says, come and investigate. You can investigate Jesus. So just get in touch with us, office at westroadchurch.org.uk and we'd love to get you signed up for an alpha. But secondly, maybe you believe this stuff. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus. Maybe you said, yeah, I get it, David. Jesus is alive. Is it your time, like these women, to move from the background and move to the forefront? As you start to think about your family, your friends, your work, your neighbours, is it now your time, instead of perhaps being a little bit in the shadows, to step up and start to share this great news? Jesus is alive. He didn't resuscitate. He resurrected. No one else in all history has done this. Surely this has got to be the good news we've got to share and investigate and respond to. Thanks so much for watching. God bless you this Easter time. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a
So now we're going to listen to a new song and um, it has beautiful words and in the middle of it Ian Featherstone will be reading a poem that he's written and in it it really just tells um, his story of how Jesus has completely changed his life, how this truth about the resurrection has absolutely made a difference to him. Yeah. So just sit back and, and listen to this and, and enjoy hearing Ian's testimony through it um, and then we'll be moving into a time um, of worship together with, with a very well-known him. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, help me.
I remember my dark days enslaved in Egypt, dancing to the tune of the taskmaster's whip. The devil held me tight, I was firmly in his grip. Oh, will I ever leave this dark land of Egypt? And it got worse still when he asked for bricks without straw. The devil stripped me of my resources, but still demanded more. I stooped to new lows, lows I hadn't stooped to before. Oh, the pain and the misery of the bricks without straw. But God sent a redeemer, I saw my chance to be free. I made a dash but got caught between the devil and the Red Sea. But with courage and faith I put my trust in he who parted the tides and made a way for me. Now I have my freedom, I'm wandering free. But when the desert gets hot, Egypt can still look appealing to me. I can build golden calves and again be burdened by the yoke of slavery. Or I can stand firm and remember it is for freedom that Christ has set me free. To take away my sin 
that brings us to the end of our Easter service. We hope that you've been challenged um, mm. to really think about um, the truth behind Easter um, and that you've also been encouraged and blessed as a result of joining us this morning. Absolutely. It's a real privilege to have your company this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your bank holiday weekend to join us here this morning. And uh, if you have any questions that have arisen from our time together, then please do not hesitate to contact us here at church. The details will be appearing on your screen as I speak. But we're going to leave you with one last special item. This is a spoken word piece written and performed by Josh Luce. It's called You Were Counted and it's very beautiful and poignant. Um, so just sit back and, uh, and listen to these beautiful words that Josh has written. And it just comes to us just to wish you all a very happy and blessed Easter. Absolutely. Happy Easter. God bless. I've often heard my friends using the words unworthy, unforgivable, too late, in too deep, undeserving. They think they're earning what they're getting and therefore if they've been letting days go by messing with something threatening, it's not heaven they're expecting. Well, it's depressing, they're just accepting where they think that they are heading, they're sunsetting without blessing and they see no point in begging. But somewhere within, there's a wishing feeling, if only I had something more to believe in, I'm secretly seeking a meaningful reason. You might see that they're breathing, but their souls are screaming. If you find yourself resonating with any of the words I'm stating, please keep concentrating. It's about to get liberating. Here's what I believe. Jesus took the weight of every sin. He bore each one upon his skin and in the list of scars set in, you were counted. 
A father killed his only son and threw his unconditional love in every drop of perfect blood. You were counted. He paid the ultimate sacrifice in which he made no compromise and through the thorns and agony eyes, you were counted. He had the vision so you have the view. He's the one who sees straight through and through his death you can be made new. You are counted. See, it's not about earning. You're not earning what you're getting. Actually, it's about accepting. This kind of love cannot be bought. You can't make him love you more because his love has no condition. Through his death, we are forgiven. And now we celebrate. He is risen. And you might think your life is too complex to handle. You struggle with doubt and you can't understand all the pain that you're feeling, the wrestling inside, the things you've done wrong that you're trying to hide and the way it corrupts and takes over your mind. I am alive because he died. The one who turns my dark to light, my shield, my shelter, my source, my guide. When Jesus took a Roman cross, he was saving all of us. And therefore what I say is true. All of us includes you. Three days passed and then he rose. He conquered death so we would know there's nothing God can't overthrow. I am alive because he died. An innocent man, unfairly tried, for my survival certified. You were counted. He counted you and I and all of us. Has it hit you that you're important enough and loved enough to be rescued? Jesus counted you. Do you count him? <laughs>